Good day. I'm Pete Warden, the director of the NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, California, where the weather is nice. I apologize for not being with you today, but uh, I'd like to cover a few of the uh, thoughts that uh, we have on uh, uh, infrastructure that we might put on the Moon and Mars, and I'm going to add a few things at the end about places beyond the Moon and Mars. Uh, but uh, let me start by just, uh, you know, telling you a little bit about what I'm going to tell you. Let me uh, talk a little bit about history. You know, I, I'm an old guy. Uh, I grew up in the, in the 1950s and 60s, and I kind of call this the aerospace era. The, uh, you know, we did a lot of cool things. We developed rockets, did space travel. We've been to virtually every planet in the solar system, and we're now even going to uh, dwarf planets that uh, used to be called planets. Uh, but I, I really want to make a point to that uh, uh, this is a new era that I call this century the bio century, and I put the picture of this gentleman on here for a couple reasons. This is J. Craig Venter. Uh, first of all, his brother works for me, uh, but more importantly, uh, uh, Dr. Venter is is kind of the leader of, uh, of bioengineering. Not only reading DNA, I mean, he uh, did the first uh, uh, full human genome of, of himself, by the way, uh, but he's doing a lot of work on writing DNA. And I think this is really uh, one of the messages I want to take you to know, take away is that that biotech may be more important than aerospace uh, as we move out into the solar system. Now, of course, most of the focus is on this object. Uh, uh, for those of you that aren't astronomy experts, it's Mars. Uh, but uh, you know, throughout. Uh, you know, my lifetime and probably everybody's lifetime, we've talked about Mars as a likely place for humans to uh, eventually live. Uh, so there's lots of concepts and thoughts about large-scale Mars settlement. Uh, indeed, you know, a good percentage of science fiction talks about humans living on Mars in, in large numbers. Well, I'd like to talk a, a little bit about some of the, uh, of the issues there. Uh, first of all, you know, when we got to Mars in the 19... Uh, 70s, uh, uh, we found that uh, it wasn't like the science fiction authors talked about. In fact, it kind of looked like a, a dry, barren desert. Now, at that time, I was a graduate student at the University of Arizona, and this looked a lot like Tucson, so it didn't look that barren to me, but uh, nonetheless, it, it, it clearly didn't look like kind of a, 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 a reasonable place to live. Now, since then, we've discovered a lot of things. Uh, first of all, we've discovered that that Mars has a lot of volatiles, particularly water. In fact, there's even places it snows. Uh, we see glaciers. Uh, and maybe most importantly, the Phoenix lander found that at the higher latitudes, right below the surface, uh, as you can see in, the, in, in, in this chart, that there's ice. In fact, there's so much water ice, uh, we think, on the, uh, just below the surface on Mars, if it was melted, it would form an ocean several hundred meters thick across the entire planet. So we're finding that the planet isn't dry. In fact, it's, uh, it's quite wet. Uh, indeed, uh, from orbit, we actually see seasonal flows of what appears to be water uh, from areas uh, like some of the glaciers. So uh, this is a much more wet planet, which tells us that it might be more favorable to life. Now, uh, to talking about life, uh, several uh, 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 over a decade ago, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a report uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Bill Clinton administration that there was a uh, life uh, or possible evidence of life in these small little fossils found in Martian meteorites. These are meteorites blasted off Mars millions of years ago that uh, we found in the, uh, for example, on the ice in Antarctica. Uh, we know they're from Mars because there's little bubbles of, of gas in there that match the Martian atmosphere. And we saw these little fossils that look amazingly like uh, bacterial fossils on Earth. Now, we've since found out that and looked at it, and most experts, I won't say all of them, but most experts believe this is not evidence of life. Uh, and by the way, there's an amusing story of, uh, of uh, this got leaked uh, the wrong way. Uh, that's something, if I ever see something, I'll tell you over a drink. But... Uh, the question is, what is there, if there is life already on Mars, in fact, the Curiosity rover has now detected variable methane, which is an evidence of, of, uh, of life on Mars. Now, this is a secret picture, uh, but uh, it does raise an interesting question. If, what if we find, uh, and I think it's probably microbial life, but large-scale uh, life on Mars? Uh, in fact, this is kind of a politically 
bipartisan concern. If you're on the left wing of things, you'll be concerned about us killing this. And if you're on the right wing, you're concerned about it killing us. So it may be possible if we find large scale life on Mars that uh, you know, humans will be prohibited or highly limited on, on going to Mars and, and visiting. Uh, there's another thing, though, that's kind of uh, that's kind of uh, uh, causes some level of of concern, although it's probably workable. Uh, one of the things that uh, the Phoenix lander found was uh, uh, perchlorate. Now, perchlorate, for those of you that don't remember, it's rocket fuel. So the good news is there's like a half percent of rocket fuel in the soil. The bad news is that perchlorates are toxic. So this raises a, 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 an interesting point. Uh, the, uh, in fact, uh, here on, uh, uh, on Earth, if you have more than six parts per billion in the California drinking water, uh, we have to take the perchlorate out. Mars is five million parts per billion. A perchlorate, among other things, uh, blocks the, uh, the functioning of the thyroid. So this is an interesting point. It also begins to explain why we didn't see organics in some of our uh, uh, experiments, because perchlorates, when they're heated, they burn. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, chemical, both for good and bad reasons. Uh, it's a, it is a resource, a high energy resource, but it's, but it's toxic. Uh, we're finding that chlorine is widespread on Mars, probably perchlorate. So we even see that it's uh, inside some of the sedimentary rocks found by uh, Curiosity. Uh, so in some sense, uh, Mars may end up being uh, uh, banned for easy human habitation. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about technologies that could fix some of this, but let's move to another object. Uh, Again, for those of you that aren't astronomy experts, this is the moon, or those of you that never look up at night. Uh, but uh, the moon is very interesting. A few years ago here at uh, Ames Research Center, we led a mission called LCROSS, Lunar Crater Observing and Sensing Satellite, which was designed to direct a uh, impactor into the poles of the moon. Uh, in fact, I got in a little trouble because I referred to it as bombing the moon, but that's another story for a drink. Uh, at any rate, uh, when we did this, we're able to measure uh, the abundances of various material in the polar, lunar polar craters. Uh, indeed, we found out that in the bottom of these craters, in the poles of the moon, there's roughly 5% uh, water and other volatiles. Indeed, all of the things we find there are exactly what's needed to support uh, life. Uh, and by the way, we didn't find any perchlorate. But uh, this is an interesting uh, possibility that uh, actually the moon may be a better location for uh, early human activity and settlement. Uh, so a lot of the effort that's going on, uh, uh, and I'll say particularly in the private sector, uh, which is a, a growing area, is to look at uh, can we actually live in the lunar polar regions. Now I would be remiss if I didn't mention asteroids. Asteroids are very rich in these life-supporting volatiles. There's been a lot of uh, studies of asteroids and comets, which are uh, really asteroids that uh, come from further out in the, in the solar system. Indeed, NASA is our primary next human target, is an asteroid. We're planning to grab an asteroid and, and bring it into close to the moon where we can visit it. Uh, but I'd like to point out this is a very interesting object. This is the dwarf planet Ceres. Uh, this is a very recent set of data. Uh, that the dawn probe is about to go into orbit around it. But uh, this may end up being the best place for human settlement, even better than the moon. Uh, it's out in the asteroid belt, but it appears to be, uh, have high composition of volatiles, and indeed there may even be uh, some sort of water uh, subsurface ocean below it. Uh, uh, so I'd like to kind of leave that as another thought to you. Uh, now let me talk about technologies, because that's what you really wanted me to do. And if you ask what you really need if you live uh, on another world, you really would like a self-replicating -repli programmable machine that can able to build an infrastructure from the resources that you find uh, uh, on that planet. Uh, and as I noted, I think volatiles are a key one, uh, although in some cases the place, things like perchlorate uh, is, an, is another uh, real asset. Uh, you also would like some sort of computing and computing capability that uh, is pretty autonomous. We here at Ames believe that quantum computing may be the next step to true AI. 
Uh, and, and fortunately, we have right next door to Ames a small startup uh, you possibly have heard of. Uh, Google, I believe, is their name. Uh, they bought this quantum computer uh, in concert with us, uh, and we've been doing work on it. Uh, and we think that uh, it is a key step towards true autonomy uh, and maybe even what you call artificial intelligence. So this is one of the technologies you might want to send to a place like Mars or the moon or one of the asteroids uh, uh, before we send humans there that could direct some of the efforts to put in place the infrastructure to support life. Now another uh, idea, and this is one I'm very excited about, and this is why I put Craig Venter's picture on here, is synthetic biology. The ability to engineer the genomes of initially bacteria to produce what we need off Earth. Uh, this is cyanobacteria, which is probably the perfect chassis. Indeed, we were working with cyanobacteria. It may have been the first life form on Earth. Uh, it's photosynthetic bacteria in the presence of light, uh, carbon dioxide, water, and a few trace elements. It can produce just about anything. Uh, and if we could program that, we can do amazing things. Indeed, our first test in space is on this mission called Eucropus, which is a joint mission with the German Space Agency that will, ex that will demonstrate variable gravity similar to what you would find on the Moon or uh, Mars, a one-sixth and one-third uh, gravity, where we can test synthetic biology. Indeed, we're testing cyanobacteria in its ability to synthesize sugars uh, and excrete them, uh, frankly, from urine. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great uh, idea that you produce sugar from pee. Uh, so the ultimate vision is that we transmit information, not things, whether it's to the moon or Mars, and use programmable uh, organisms, probably directed by some sort of AI or autonomous system, to produce the infrastructure we need. Indeed, my vision is that when the first humans show up on the moon or Mars, they come to a habitat already built, uh, a robot opens the door and hands them a martini made from synthetic biology uh, activities on, on in situ resources. Now, another key technology is 3D printing. Indeed, a, a partner here in our research park, Made in Space, just launched the first 3D printer to the International Space Station. So our ability to print out stuff, uh, indeed the hardware we need on, on another planet, is already being developed. Uh, but the key question is, can we transmit and print out life, uh, or at least the genome, over great distances? Now this sounded pretty science fiction, but I go back to this guy again, uh, Craig Venter. This was an experiment we did with Craig out in the desert. Uh, he's also a motorcycle enthusiast. Uh, we ha he brought his lab out, uh, and we, we took cyanobacteria that you find under rocks, and, this, uh, and we sequenced it and sent it back uh, to his lab where we're going to try to reconstruct the cellular structure. So a very interesting concept is to transmit life and print it out uh, on other worlds. Indeed, Craig's wrote, written a book about it, which I'd commend for you to read. Uh, and other companies are now looking at 3D printers for living things. Uh, this is a company called Cambrian uh, Genomics. Uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, another key technology is small satellites. Uh, I know Rick Fleeter, uh, who's there with you, is, uh, is a big advocate of this. In fact, he got me into small satellites. This is a real picture of some of the first CubeSats launched from the International Space Station a few years ago. The one in the middle is ours uh, at Ames. Uh, we're also looking at interplanetary CubeSats. This is a, an example of a, uh, of a small CubeSat you could send any place in the solar system. Uh, we're working with Professor Ben Longmire at the University of Michigan. Now, let me close with a little bit of a discussion about, you know, I think the solar system is, is way too local and boring. Uh, so one of the things we're looking at is interstellar systems. Uh, uh, the Kepler mission, which is one of our missions here at Ames, has discovered dozens of planets uh, uh, in the habitable zone, some not much different in the size to the Earth. So uh, there are probably places that we could go, uh, probably around some of the nearest stars. Uh, we found some planets that are almost identical to the Earth uh, in, this, in this data. Well, let me start with a, a very interesting system. This is the nearest stellar system, the Alpha Centauri system. It has two stars that are, uh, in, that are pretty close together, uh, one a little bigger than the sun, one a little smaller, and then it has a very distant small star. Uh, but the, the next question is, are there planets around these? There's some evidence there's a small planet 
Randolph Centauri B, but we're very interested here on a mission, and this is a low-cost, small-sat mission, that probably by the end of this decade could find, are there Earths, or Earth-like objects around Alpha Centauri A and B? Uh, the next step, of course, is figure out how to get there. Not easy, but uh, I think we're setting our sights uh, here at NASA and at Ames, uh, not only at uh, expanding human presence into the solar system, but beyond. Uh, and in conclusion, uh, I'd really like to, uh, to, to thank you for uh, uh, your attention to this. Uh, uh, again, I apologize for not being here, uh, but uh, if you'd like, please come and, and uh, send me an email or, or come out and visit us. Thank you.